Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Under the Macroscope, Skybound Capital's regular podcast series. Today, we are talking not everything, but uh, many things, VC and private equity. And we're doing so with one of the founders of Knife Capital, which has been a, a successful long-term partnership that's been enjoyed by Skybound Capital. Kiet van Sale, great to have you with us. Uh, this has been a good journey uh, between Knife Capital and Skybound Capital. Skybound's been there pretty much since day one. Uh, and let's go back to the start of Knife Capital before we fast forward to, to things that are happening in the space right now. When you launched, it was very much on the back of 12J. So perhaps for our, our viewers, our listeners, you, you can explain 12J, what it meant in, in the context of the South African uh, revenue service and, and how that uh, sparked uh, some, some new ideas in the VC space. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, so, so from a, yeah, maybe goes a little bit further back. So, um, you know, the Knife Capital has its, has its origins at Mark Shuttleworth's Yebi Dragons Fund. So the co-founder, Yebin van Yeden and myself, met there, worked there for a number of years and invested um, Mark Shuttleworth's venture capital funds. And at some point, sort of the stars collided for us to approach Mark and say, listen, we want to work with you and not for you. So can we launch our own business? Um, and that's the birth of, of, of Knife Capital. The first couple of years of that, and, and basically manage the, the Shuttleworth portfolio so of, of VC assets. We bit of design and a lot of luck, but we had some really great exits early on and we were, were backing ourselves. But at that stage, the venture capital space in South Africa was still very much fledgling. It wasn't an, an asset, it's still not really an asset class other than really some, some, some sophisticated investors like Skybound really understanding the asset class, getting their heads around the managers. And we did a lot of stuff with angel investors and so forth. But at, at some point, you know, gov government sort of changed a few things in 12J, which is basically just a tax incentive to incentivize high net worth individuals to to back the space. You know, this is a, is a highly important space for any economy because of innovation, job creation, and economic growth and, and the flywheel that creates. But, you know, as all things, we didn't, as South Africa, implement that, that, that as well as we should have as a, as, a, as a country. But anyway, that gave us the opportunity to approach more high net worth individuals to say, look, there's a tax incentive to back the space. We are accredited fund as are some others. And this is, this is what we want to do, just basically continue investing in the same, same type of innovation-driven ventures with traction, help the entrepreneurs grow, and, and so forth. Yeah, so I think that was the, the start of it. But, 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 but still, I mean, up to that point, no institutional investor has ever backed Knife, you know. And I mean, if it wasn't for the individuals like the Shuttleworth, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I think at some point, as you know, uh, famously, we sat in the boardroom up here and, 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 and we, we, we basically said, okay, look, we're not interested in 12J, we're interested in the returns. Tell us about the asset class. And I think yeah. that's where our partnership started. So Knife Capital is, is a fund manager and there was a fund uh, called KNF. And there's, there's a bit of history there, knowledge, networks, funding. And, and funding is the obvious component. Knowledge is, is what the likes of yourself, Eben van Heerden, Andrea Bormet brought to the table. But networks is important in this space, isn't it? Uh, talk to us about the importance of the people that you back, as opposed to just the idea. Yeah, this is a this is a, 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 a different asset class where you we need those components. You know, funding is an is a commodity. It's an enabler. Um, entrepreneurs think they really that's the thing that they need. But um, you know, with enough networks, you can actually um, close enough uh, sales. That so that you don't need funding, you know. So so I think funding is a is an expensive thing to trade at at a risk stage of the investment because we're not talking about loan funding or anything like that. So the type of funding that VCs provide are is basically equity funding. So we take a minority stake, let's say 10, 20, 30 percent stake of the business in exchange for growth capital, you know, and then we help active on the board and so forth to to grow that. But actually, much more important than than the funding is the the knowledge, not just the knowledge that a, um, a funding growth partner can bring to the table, but you know the the broader uh, coalition of the willing of, of <laughs> wanting to make this startup um, successful, and we enable that through networks. You know, to, to be able to 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 sit in front of a 
a client or to be able to, to get the right staff components or a soft landing if you go to the UK or the US for growth or, or whatever, you know, we, we can't really throw funding at that part of the, part of the component. It is, it is actually more a, a networking game, you know. Mm. And this is probably a horribly generalist question, but generally speaking, in the work that you've done with South African entrepreneurs, how willing are they to accept input from outside? There, there, there tends to be uh, this feeling that entrepreneurs are very protective over what is essentially their baby yeah, yeah. Uh, and don't necessarily accept uh, that they have to give up part of their baby in order to grow. I mean, what's been your experience? Yeah, you have to you have to put some some kid gloves on to to approach that because as as Andrea, my my other partner, and I always says like it's basically exactly that you're calling the the baby ugly post due diligence. <laughs> you know, you you do this, you you look at an interesting business plan, um, you you do a due diligence, another word word for homework, and afterwards there's some good news and some bad news. You know, to basically entrepreneur, you want to go from here to there. Um, but these are the growth gaps that you haven't addressed, either sins of the past or, or blind spots. That, that And for us, it's conditional upon our investment that we close these gaps, you know, and, and that is a coachability element of it. So, so your question is how willing are South African entrepreneurs for that? I mean, it's a, an entrepreneur is an, an interesting animal. You want someone that, that doesn't take no for an answer, that really believes in their gut feel and, and, and basically does not conform to, to the, 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 the standards. But at the same time, you, you, you want them to listen to you as an investor. So, so you, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a give or take. But we do test for that in, in due diligence in terms of, of, the, of the, the, the team and the humans around it and, and how willing would that entrepreneur be to relinquish some element of control and, yeah. and if, if they are absolutely not be able to if, if they can't do that then then we will, will not invest and in your world Kit, there's, a, there's an extra layer of responsibility because you're conducting due diligence and you're making investment decisions on your behalf but also on behalf of uh, some investors through your fund in this space how important are your no's as opposed to your yeses. Do you think that maybe when you, you look back on some of the decisions you've made, uh, that you could fairly say that uh, you've been as proud of those that you said no to as, as opposed to those ones that you back? Well, there's a, there's a few that slipped through the cracks, which, which we said no to, which we probably now would say, mm, maybe we should have done, you know, which is, which is always part of the game. But um, on, a, on a whole 80-20 rule, like, thank goodness, we, 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 do, we do say no. I mean, we only can do a number of deals a year, and we get hundreds and hundreds of business plans. You know, a lot of them is just not fundable because it's not, it's not great. And some of them are average, and some of them really are good, but it, mm. for whatever is not, not a good fit. I think the worst thing, and there's a bit of self-criticism, that a VC can give an entrepreneur is a slow maybe. You know, so, so a fast no at least can get them you know, okay, well, then it's not knife and, and maybe give them a, a little bit of insight of is it pricing, is it, is it just a, a fit for the portfolio, is it because we already have a competitive deal. Sometimes it's not because, dear entrepreneur, I don't believe in your plan. It's, there, mm. There's other factors at play, timing, size, investment, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so we, we try and help. And if we say no with someone that has impressed us, we through networks, we will always refer, you know, say, look, maybe you should speak to, to that VC, which is a little bit more on your stage or high net with individual or, it's, or whatever the case may be. But the no's are part and parcel of it. And um, yes, we, we constantly refine the art um, in terms of, of, of what sentence to use, because at the same time, those deals come back, you know, mm -hmm. so you want to leave, you want to say no, but, but the company then grows a little bit more and de-risks itself to a, to a degree and you want that entrepreneur to say, you know, I'm going to phone Knife Capital up again and see if they're interested this time, you know, yeah. and, and, and it's, a, it's a fine balance. The dreaded COVID kit, how did it affect you uh, philosophically as much as anything else, but more tangibly your portfolio companies? Look, a, a VC is, is, a, is, is a glorified services business, you know, as, as you mentioned earlier. We, we act on behalf of, of funders that, that, that back us. We put our own money on the table as well alongside, which, which basically gives sort of the ethics towards a vested interest, you know, um, and, and, and all of that. So, so when we, because we're like a services business and we already have 
operations in the UK, in Jersey. Um, we, we didn't really, personally as a business, uh, it didn't really affect us in terms of how we ran our day-to-day -day businesses. We were already on Zoom, we already have the setups, mm. you know, whether we're in the office or not. Even now we go to the offices on Mondays and Fridays and the rest of the time as and when there's meetings. And, and we, we always, we spend a lot of time at the portfolio company. So, but that part got affected because mm. the, the human element got lost. You know, some things you just cannot negotiate on uh, clause 12.3. You know, sometimes mm. you have to sit someone down over a coffee and say, listen, how are we going to handle this sticky situation? So it did, it def it did affect the way we did due diligences, mm. the way we interacted with entrepreneurs. But our portfolio itself, because it, it had an interesting upside effect for us, because before COVID, um, we were always the, the investors that in these crazy guys invested in this tech stuff that no one understands and, and all the rest of it. But post-COVID, we are the, the safe pair of hands that understand technology where, where, where everyone has had to move online. And for most of our portfolio, it actually had a, had a, um, had a very positive effect. You know, mm. there, were, there were obviously like many, many treacherous things to navigate. But for instance, online education, we're quite education heavy. You know, we, yeah. we have got some, some companies involved in the pharmaceutical space for cold chain um, for, uh, vaccine management, you know, and, and there's, a, there's a couple of examples where our portfolio companies are now m m catalyzed much better because of COVID. But so, so yeah, we had to change the way we interact with entrepreneurs and it definitely affected that part of our business negatively, but the online part um, and, the, and the scalability and the software as a services businesses positively. And I, I suppose the very nature of the businesses that you are involved with and the stage uh, that they are at means it's constantly evolving. So if I had to take a look back to when you launched and you're now into fund three, how has the sector, you said you're not sure if you can even call it a, an asset class as yet, but yet, uh, how, how has it evolved over, over that period of time and, and where are we at now? It's been such an exciting time to be a, a, a venture capitalist in let's call it Africa. I mean, I know it's a big continent and different countries and all the rest of it, but it really, you know, the tenacity of, of, of African entrepreneurs and the meaningful challenges that they solve mm. um, it has become quite a competitive advantage of, uh, as, a, as, a, as a collective set of ecosystems, you mm. know. So, so therefore, you know, some, some other ecosystems, which is maybe more mature, it's maybe more, um, you know, it's not like, banking the unbanked or fintech or health mm. prob tech problems or you know all these so-called adversity and challenges that we have around here has 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 let people take notice of what's happening here so a lot more capital was available or came into the space a lot more lot, lots more competitors i guess to to knife capital which is which is good with my ecosystem hat on and even with my knife hat on you know because you, you co-invest you know you can't always just do every deal in 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 that, in, in that space um but through, through all of that, I think there's also a little bit of a rush of blood to the head. I mean, the, 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 the global economic slow, slow, slow down right now has, has brought a lot of the valuations and everything down to earth again. But, you know, there's some of these transactions we looked at where it was a bit too easy for entrepreneurs that could build a profile, mm. build a business plan and, and, and get access to capital, which allowed them to be capital inefficient. Mm. So it just means you know, you, you, you have a hell of a burn rate, you know, your expenses are, are, are massive and you can fund it through, through, through funding. But when, when, the, when the funders start sort of like saying, okay, hang on, let's just see what's, where this is all going, you know, your burn rate continues or you have to downsize the business and the growth starts slowing down. So how has it evolved? Well, 10 years ago when we, or 12 years ago now when we started Knife, there were only really in South Africa specifically three or four VCs worth their salt. There's now many more, many angels have, have, have entered the space and the entrepreneurs themselves have, 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 have really come to the party and um, are more, I suppose, sophisticated and also in a way that they allocate their own capital. You know, mm -hmm. just, some entrepreneurs just don't want to raise capital because they, they, they feel their equity is worth more than switching it for, unless they can understand the knowledge networks funding game. Which is a key component. Now, and, and as you see success, and perhaps even more importantly, future success in your portfolio companies. How much of a temptation is there to say, well, I, I, 
I want to shift slightly out of mandate here. Is, is there a danger that you potentially lose focus? Because it must be tempting to say, well, we, we want to follow on here. We, we, we've brought them to this point with our yeah. insights, with our knowledge, with our networks, and we want to participate in, in that future success. Yeah, look, I mean, luckily we're a team of, of uh, I suppose, uh, interesting uh, mix of individuals. Um, you, you, you know, I'm, I'm more on the front line, the hunter. Then we have our investment committee that, 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 that puts on the, the mandate breaks and, 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 and basically asks the right questions. So, so I think from that perspective, it's always tempting to, to, to really, because you, you do fall in love with these entrepreneurs and their yeah. business plans and the growth, and, and you kind of get swept up in some of it. But at the end of the day, you know, building a business now, whether it's an algorithm or whether it's anything else, is the same as it's always been. You know, it's all about sales, understanding your your, your um, value proposition, really converting a pipeline of opportunities, and um, and make sure that that leads to actual revenue. You know, so so we focus quite a lot on the on the uh, unit economics of these businesses, which sound very boring, but the end of the day it is business you know and um, you talked about the asset class a little bit earlier for for knife capital if you wake up any of our partners in the middle of the night and say what is your purpose it's really to give credibility to this asset class mm. and credibility through this asset class cannot be a PR exercise you know capital allocators or, or limited partners will only back this asset class if it delivers mm. real tangible returns mm. therefore we, 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 we have to force ourselves to, to stick to the plan um, and and you know not just not just go go wild out there and and do you see as one of the major benefits of this space if we if we lump together which is a little bit irresponsible but VC private equity do you, do you see that sort of personal involvement uh, between the likes of yourselves and management taking board seats is is that a critical differentiator for the space as opposed to being actually not in control at all of perhaps uh, a listed investment. And because you have that personal involvement, it, it, it's a good uh, diversifier for a, for a portfolio. Absolutely. So um, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex answer because you actually have to start with the construct of the South African ecosystem. You know, mm -hmm. how, how does, what role does government play? How many investors are there? The role of academia, you know, the, the universities, the, the the actual types of technology that we that we build from here. How big is our consumer market versus our business to business market, and, and and all of that. So if you if you if you just sort of park that as an ecosystem, and then look at at how does how does how does VC or private equity kind of grow into that ecosystem, the liquidity, the types of investments you do, and and all that, you know there becomes th that, that personal touch becomes highly important you know it's not because we have all this knowledge but it's because an earlier stage entrepreneur does not have for instance a cfo and a head of marketing and a, a this that and the other thing you know there, there's 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 heavy lifting needs to be done there's there's softer issues that need to be be addressed to i mean you would know how many entrepreneurs you've helped me coach mm -hmm. around just how to conduct themselves into mm -hmm. a meeting and a very important meeting to be able to close that deal or get to the next meeting you don't have that those kind of issues if you buy shares on the on the JSE into a company which has that stuff sorted out, you know. So, so we act as a facilitator to whatever it takes, you know. If we we have to count the petty cash, we'll do that, you know. If we have to fly to an important meeting, we'll do that. But, mm -hmm. but more importantly, it's a you know I always I always joke to become a, a and it's sort of not even a joke to become a venture capital. Studied accounting, studied law, studied MBA and, and intellectual property. And I should have studied drama and um, <laughs> and psychology, you know, because of because of the f because of this human life sciences thing, which I'm well now equipped for, but wasn't 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 studying studying for. But but that, that's where that's where all it needs. Sometimes these entrepreneurs just need to bounce some stuff off you, you know. Yeah. Well, it's fair to say that uh, that relationships are critically important, both at the initial phase of an investment, and then how you develop those relationships with with the entrepreneur and their team? Yeah, look, I mean, it's not, uh, it's, it's not a, it's, it's complex, but basically it starts with find, make, grow, realize. You know, so our, we find interesting entrepreneurs to invest in, but we also find credible investors that could actually play more, more of a role than just sort of like, like give money, you know, so we need to, we need to work that, 
making an investment is um, all about the due diligence, but also the valuation you go into fair terms. You know, you must make sure that this is a growth partner. You know, you can't mm. kind of go in. I mean, this is a long-term partnership. You you can't go in like out negotiate your future partner in in the make phase because the most important phase is the growth phase. So, mm. and that is all about market access. So, we need to get those clients. Need to get the revenue up. Not so much worried about the profitability in the short term. More worried about just surviving cash flow wise. You know, but if if you can survive that with increasing revenue in the growth phase, and then you need to know why. So I think that's where also a lot of entrepreneurs grow for the sake of growing. But um, you know, strategy 101 is well, you need to know where to grow to, otherwise you will never get there. So so I think for us to that realization strategy, the exits, and and that is is remains important. And then repeat, you know, and repeat. So <laughs> find make grow realize just stick to those four things it's it's been a a wonderful relationship that we've enjoyed with knife capital and uh, thanks for your time and some fascinating insights there if you'd like to find out more about knife capital and the work that they do some of their portfolio companies you can get in touch with us uh, on the email address info at skyboundcapital.com and indeed if you have any questions uh, about the venture capital private equity space it's it's something that certainly skybound capital pays a lot of attention to we thank Kiet van Sale for his time don't forget if you'd like to uh, subscribe to under the macroscope you can do so at apple spotify or the google podcast platform for android and all past editions of under the macroscope are available at our website at www.skyboundcapital.com Kiet, always good to catch up Thank you for your time Thanks, and man, yeah. uh, here's to, to many more years of, of collaboration. Thank you, yeah, absolutely. Until next time on Under the Macroscope, cheerio.